It's 6.30 a.m. On a cool September morning. I'm standing in the kitchen, but I'm not standing still. The coffee is brewing and the house is bustling with activity for me and my two young sons. Andy Jr. 6 just started first grade and his little brother Harry 4 is in his last year of kindergarten. My husband Andy Collins, 45, is already at work and the owner of a successful independent residential heating, air conditioning and plumbing business. My name is Marilyn, I'm 35 years old, I'm the mother of these two active boys and Andy's wife. A trophy wife, indeed. Classic second wife too. Andy had a short marriage before meeting me, but more on that later. Spoiled wife? Well, I think I can admit that too. Andy and I have been happily married for over 10 years. I've been living my best life as a stay-at-home mom since Andy Dior came along. I love this time in our lives, watching the boys grow up. Especially now that they are no longer in diapers. Andy's growing business allows us all to enjoy an enviable, privileged lifestyle, something neither he nor I were accustomed to for most of our lives. Now that the boys are in school, I have at least half a day to focus on myself, working out, shopping, keeping my athletic body 5'6", 125 pounds handsome, and full of sex appeal. I place the bowl of cereal in front of Andy Juar and cut up waffles for Harry. Come on, boys, eat, you'll miss the bus. I bustle around the kitchen, cleaning and preparing lunches for the boys. The nausea I felt yesterday morning is returning. I take a bite of my bagel and take a small sip of my coffee, hoping it will settle my stomach. Maybe a minute in the chair would help, but it really just highlights the stress I'm feeling as we're all a little behind on our morning schedule. Boys, go upstairs and get dressed. Faster. I drag myself out of the kitchen and head towards their rooms to monitor the process. At the top of the stairs, my severe discomfort does not disappear. Instead of turning right towards the boys' rooms, I make a sharp left into the bathroom, slamming the door behind me. I'm in a cold sweat. Almost immediately, those few pieces of bagel and coffee eaten a few minutes earlier are thrown down the toilet. I could have dealt with this if it hadn't happened for the third day in a row this week. The feeling is all too familiar. I think it's happened to me twice before with Andy Juar and Harry. Oh shit, I say out loud, covering my mouth and hoping the boys didn't hear. Oh damn, that's for sure. I rinse my mouth in the sink and get ready to drag the kids to the bus. I'm dizzy from all the consequences that I can no longer deny. One thing is for sure Andy will kill me when he finds out. I can't let him find out I'm pregnant. How could this even happen? Especially considering Andy's condition. I knew all the risks from the very beginning. And now I feel like a complete fool. Nine months ago. Saturday, early December. The day Andy and the boys are home together. They're in the yard, cleaning, raking leaves, basically just making a mess of themselves. Andy uses a leaf blower to create a huge pile of leaves, and the boys have fun jumping into it. I'm busy preparing our lunch tomato soup and grilled cheese sandwiches. Lunch is ready come inside. I scream from the kitchen window into the yard. The boys appear in the kitchen. Andy knows better, sticks back to remove shoes, socks and other items of clothing covered in leaves and debris from the yard. Unfortunately, he did not stop the boys, who now brought the garbage from the street inside. Back to the garage. Take off your shoes. Shake off your clothes. There is extreme seriousness in my voice. Andy and the boys return and lunch continues. For me, however, everything is already ruined. My lunch is getting cold as I stop to clean up the mess on the kitchen floor. Stop and eat, honey. I'll clean up our mess later. I ignore him. Andy's carelessness in allowing the boys to run into the house without taking off their jackets and shoes infuriates me. I'm very angry, and the silence at the table means everyone knows it. As lunch ends, Andy comes to hug me, and I push him away. Marilyn, what's got you so upset? The fact that he doesn't understand just adds to my irritation. I brush off his question and suggest that he go outside without the boys to finish things in the yard or I'll call the landscaper on Monday and ask him to do it, which is what I expected. I'm sorry I'm so angry now. Realistically, it's my fault. I have mood swings. 
The situation in the kitchen just drove me crazy, and I'm sorry because it's ruining the mood for our anniversary dinner tonight. Ten years. This is our chance for an intimate reunion. We have already hired a nanny. Now we will have to spend today's romantic dinner resolving the stress of this day, instead of getting ready to celebrate our anniversary. Nanny arrives at six. My ice melts somewhat when Andy takes us to dinner. I'm once again looking forward to opening a bottle of wine and enjoying an intimate dinner together. We sit down and the waiter pours the wine. Cabernet, worthy of a special occasion. We toast to the next ten years and enjoy the first sip. I'm sorry I lost control of my emotions today, Andy. I shouldn't have taken my frustrations out on you. I don't want to talk about it anymore. He smiles and reaches across the table to take mine. I want to talk about how we celebrate this milestone the right way. Vacation for a couple. Or jewelry. How can I show you a sign of love and how happy I am that you are my wife? I sigh and take a long sip of wine for courage. Andy, if you really want to show me how much you love me, you need to schedule that procedure we talked about earlier. Andy's eyes narrowed. We've already discussed this before. I thought we agreed that our family remains. Incomplete. Neither of us was ready to do something irreversible. This was a chance to say something thoughtful. Instead, I blurted out, You just turned forty-five. We already have two boys. I'm completely satisfied. Whatever I thought, I had to stop there. Instead, I felt the need to continue. The pills were fine when we first got married. But now, after two pregnancies, breastfeeding, again on hormones, and again without them, I am older. Damn, I don't know. I just can't stand it anymore. I hate how this makes me feel some days. I have to finally stop taking these damn hormonal drugs. There was some awkward little thing. The waiter appeared to take our dinner order. Andy changed the subject from family planning. He was ready to move on and our dinner continued without incident. We returned home and after paying the babysitter, Andy carried me up the stairs in his arms. We made love. There is a 10-year age difference between Andy and me. Enough to be non-trivial, but not enough to be extremely relevant. Enough time for Andy to have been married and divorced before meeting me. Andy and Angie dated in college, but unexpectedly broke up before their third year. Angie soon began dating Brandon. There was an incident at one of the parties when Andy saw Brandon and friends behaving inappropriately with a very drunk Angie. Andy felt he had to intervene and punched Brandon to stop the situation. It was later revealed that Angie was grateful for Andy's intervention as she did not consent to what was happening. Some time later, Andy and Angie reconciled and got married after graduating from college. After three years of working together at the same company, Andy caught Angie kissing Brandon at a bar. Andy hit Brandon again. This time, Andy was arrested and received a prison sentence for assault, despite Angie's admission that the kiss was consensual. He was sentenced to 12 months in prison, of which six months were suspended. After his release, Andy's world changed completely. He was fired from his job in advertising sales. Angie was divorcing him. They had married too early. She did not want to stay married to such an aggressive and controlling man now with a prison background. Without a wife, a job, or a place to live, Andy needed a fresh start. He accepted the first and only job he could find working on the installation crew for an old high school friend with a small heating and air conditioning installation business. This job became Andy's salvation. Soon he was not only installing air conditioners, but also selling customers their new systems. His talent for sales extended beyond the business, and the company soon grew to a dozen employees. The school friend who hired him offered Andy to buy out his share his wife was transferred to work on the other side of the country, and he wanted capital to start his business there. Andy didn't hesitate and quickly took over the company as sole owner. Andy's bombastic, larger-than-life personality was a perfect fit for the home maintenance business. He was the first to arrive at the office, usually at five or six in the morning, restocked service vans and dispatched technicians. Andy's business became his new mistress. He never dated the girls from the office, 
and the endless flow of work and affairs allowed him to forget about the painful divorce. I had just graduated from college and was ready for my first job at 22 years old. I answered a Craigslist ad for an accountant position, and that was the day I met the man who would soon become my first husband. It was June, the peak season for home maintenance, and I was hired and put to work right away. The learning curve was grueling and the days were long. We started early, planning repairs, replacements, and installations. At that time, everything was a labor-intensive, manual process. Over time, I progressed to managing call girls, crew scheduling, and many of the executive accounting functions that I trained for in school. Everything that was critical for the profitable operation of the business. Andy was a constant presence in the office and in the field. He was always available to everyone. Luckily for me, most of the women were either already married or in serious relationships of one kind or another. Andy never glanced at anyone. At the time, I didn't know he was divorced and didn't know any details about how his first marriage ended. I would never have suspected that he was an ex-convict. After working for a whole year, I finally plucked up the courage and tried to start a relationship with Andy. I didn't want a casual affair with Andy. I wanted a relationship. It took time. Andy has built walls around himself because of the scars Angie left behind. We started dating outside the office. It was a slow process, but after six months we became more or less inseparable in and out of the office. He refused to admit our relationship to the staff, but it was an open secret that we were dating. A year later, my apartment lease was expiring and my roommate was getting married, so we weren't going to renew it. I needed to find a place to live, and I convinced Andy to let me move in with him. From that moment on, we finally became an official couple. A full year of marriage passed before Andy was ready to propose. He was 35, and I was about to turn 25. It was time for us to settle down. The next four years were devoted to business. Of course, we were newlyweds we made love every night, but Andy was never a sensual lover. It wasn't his style. We may have been husband and wife, partners in every sense, but business remained his one true love. There was no time for cuddling and emotions after sex when the alarm clock was supposed to go off at 4.30 a.m. every morning. When we first got married, the business had fewer than 50 employees still impressive by small business standards. The growth in the early years of our marriage was rapid. We have grown steadily to over 100 full-time employees and dozens of seasonal workers. We have expanded from HVAC to plumbing and electrical services. Andy remained a bombastic, larger-than-life owner who dominated every aspect of the organization, figuratively and literally. I was his full partner in all the strategic decisions he made. For my 29th birthday, I announced to Andy my intention to start our family. It's time to... I gave birth to Andy Dior, three weeks before Andy's 40th birthday nine months later. Twenty-two months after my youngest, I gave birth to Harry. I left Andy's business completely, completely absorbed in the worries of motherhood. Andy bought us a house in a luxury-gated community in an exclusive part of town. We were a happy, healthy, wealthy young family. Day 5, January. Mrs. Collins, I'm Dr. Niles, your urologist. Do you have a few minutes to discuss post-operative instructions? I stood up from my chair and joined my doctor friend in the consultation room. And he tolerated the procedure very well. He is now in intensive care. He needs to refrain from any physical activity for the next two weeks while his body heals. No exercise, nothing heavier than 20 pounds, and most importantly, no sex. For some reason, I blushed. On the 30th day after surgery, he gives a sample and we check whether he can have children. Is there anything else I need to know? Actually, yes. We took a routine blood sample from Andy during his preoperative assessment. His result increased. A healthy man his age should have a score well below 4. I prefer to see it between 1 and 2, if not below 1. Andy's was 4-7. What does this mean and should he be worried? It may not mean anything. This may be a benign enlargement of the gland. It could be an infection or even a virus. This could also be a sign of developing a disease, which is what worries me the most. 
We'll take another blood sample at his 30-day follow-up appointment and see from there. Andy was unfazed by Dr. Niles' concerns. In fact, he felt good until he encountered Dr. Niles' scalpel of procedure. I think Andy ignored the post-op instructions to annoy Dr. Dis Niles. We returned to sex on the fourth day. At the 30-day follow-up appointment, it was confirmed that he was now officially unable to have children. I was so excited to finally be able to stop taking the pills that I almost forgot about getting tested again. Dr. Ben Nye Niles' assistant wasn't so enthusiastic when she called with the results of the retest. Perhaps ignoring the instructions was a bad idea. His test level rose from 4-7 to 6, instead of dropping to 1 or 2. Dr. T. Niles insisted on further testing immediately. Two weeks later, Andy and I sat holding hands in Dr. Sabor Niles' office. Andy, I need to prepare you for good and bad news. A biopsy confirms the presence of an early stage of the disease. The key word is early stage. You won't die from this anytime soon, and we can treat you, hopefully making you completely cured. The bad news is that with diseases, the younger the patient is at diagnosis, the more aggressive the disease and the greater the likelihood of it spreading to other organs. We need to treat you decisively. Andy was white as chalk. I was preoccupied with my thoughts, realizing that my insistence on the procedure may very well have saved Andy's life. He, of course, would not undergo the examination on his own. What happens next, doctor? That's a good question. Historically, in such cases, the first treatment would have been complete removal surgery. But I have doubts in your case. Andy, you're young. Removal surgery can have lifelong complications. Almost everyone begins recovery with bowel and bladder control problems. Your ability to have sex often remains impaired. We have treatments to restore as much quality of life as possible, but before we go down that path, there is another option. Continue. The doctor told us the second option. You make it sound like the obvious choice, doctor. Dr. Niles' eyes turned to me for the next part. Andy, both treatments have side effects. You need to understand that this will be a long and possibly lifelong journey, regardless of the decisions you make today. You will need to undergo treatment for at least six months. If your tumor responds, I would expect you to remain on treatment for at least one, two years, and I often prescribe it to patients for up to three years. Naively, Andy asked about side effects. I was already looking for information about the diagnosis on the internet on my phone and was horrified by what I heard. The side effects are humbling. Your hormones will drop to almost zero. This in itself has cascading effects throughout the body. The most noticeable symptoms are a decrease in energy levels, a complete lack of desire for sex, and a complete loss of this function during treatment. Some patients quickly adapt to this. To be honest, I'm not very optimistic that this will happen in your case. Discuss this with your wife and return to the office on Monday so we can schedule your treatment. The 35-year-old trophy wife's obvious presence at Andy's side did not go unnoticed by the good doctor, Niles. Without further questions, Andy took my hand and we headed out. We were silent as he drove the car home. That night at home, we made love as usual. Andy cried like a baby after having sex for the first time in our relationship. I cried too. Neither of us could openly discuss the diagnosis or treatment options. On Sunday evening, we made love again. At 5 a.m., as always, Andy got up and went to the office. At 10 a.m., he left for an appointment with Dr. Dos Niles and returned after lunch. Andy received his first injection. The change in Andy was as rapid as it was dramatic. Night sweats, he would sweat through his bedding set every night. Fevers, nausea, loss of appetite, headache. He felt so bad that losing the desire to have sex was probably not his main problem. After the first couple of weeks, acute reactions decreased and everything stabilized. He looked pale and exhausted most of the time falling asleep in front of the TV late at night. After three months of treatment, Andy became a different person. I can't say I like this version any more definitely a calmer, softer version of Andy. But gone was the exaggerated, bombastic personality of the man I married. 
In his place was the shadow of that man who seemed thoughtful in his thoughts, deliberate in his decisions, and clearly older than his years. For the first time, I began to seriously worry about what the future held. Memorial Saturday was approaching. I really needed a long day off. Unfortunately, this was not destined to come true. Andy was once again engrossed in his business. It was, in fact, his busiest period of the year. I wanted to go to the beach with the boys. Andy suggested inviting the neighbors over for a barbecue. It was a great idea, but impractical since most of our neighbors also wanted to leave the city. Those who remained were here for a reason. Their kids had obligations, sports tournaments, family matters, you name it. Of the seven families we invited to the BBQ, only one family responded, our next-door neighbors Brian and Shannon. The doorbell rang at exactly 5 p.m. Brian came in with a tray of ribs and a case of beer. Andy took the provisions and asked, Where is Shannon? Brian turned away and calmly replied, Shannon and I broke up. She moved. I gave Andy a stern look, and he quietly offered Brian a hug. I smiled and said, Strawberry Dakewaris on the terrace in three minutes. Of course, no one could resist this. The hour of joy and dinner passed without incident. The conversation was predictable, with Andy talking about his business and Brian talking about his recent adventures as a sales representative for a pharmaceutical company. Brian worked from home most of the time, and I could only imagine how isolated he felt after his partner Shannon left. After dinner I was inevitably distracted by the worries of bathing, and putting the boys to bed tomorrow was another day of school. Andy and Brian continued to drink beer on our deck. More than an hour had passed, and the sun was already setting when I returned to the street. Before I could sit down again, Andy suddenly stood up, shook Brian's hand, and announced that he was going to bed. Rising at 4.30 comes early, he explained. I gave Andy a sidelong glance, which he never noticed. Brian took this as a sign that it was time to leave. Instead, I held up the bottle of red wine in one hand and the corkscrew in the other, catching Brian's attention. So Shannon left. Do you want to talk about it? Brian sank back into his chair. Yeah, why not? The wine was poured and Brian began his story. We lived together for three years. The first time I asked her to marry me was six months later. She refused. Our relationship continued. I kept asking her for marriage. She claimed that she was not ready. It wasn't a matter of commitment, it was just not the right time. Shannon asked for patience and I stayed close. In the end, Shannon and I became even closer. Her parents asked when we would get married. My parents did the same. Everyone expected us to announce it during the holidays, on Valentine's Day or on her birthday. I bought her a ring and suggested we plan a luxury vacation to formally propose with photographers. She still said she wasn't ready. Brian took a deep sip of red wine. A few weeks ago, she quietly told me that now is the time. She's finally ready to make our lives official. But she had one condition, and it was sacrosanct. Which? So I agree that we will never have children. Now I was the one who hesitated. We never spoke about this directly. Neither of us was in a hurry to start a family. But it was always assumed that living here, it would just happen someday. Why would anyone even live in this area if they don't plan to start a family? I understood what he was talking about. It was a wealthy, gated community. Every family was wealthy, and large families were the rule, not the exception. At 28, Brian stood out like a black sheep here. Most people his age couldn't afford a house here at all. The fact is that Brian got his house from his grandparents. He has a lifelong right to live in this house. He can't sell it, but he can live there for free as long as he wants, for the rest of his life. Anyway, two days later I came home to find Shannon's bags packed and her furniture removed. She insisted that she loved me unconditionally and that it was her unconditional love that made me realize that she was interfering with my happiness. She kissed me goodbye and walked out of my life. We haven't communicated since then. Now it was Brian's turn to suddenly change the subject. So what's going on with Andy? It was my turn to feel unprepared. I poured the rest of the wine from the bottle into our glasses. 
What made you think there was something wrong with Andy? Okay, I'm a terrible liar. But the truth is that, besides me, Andy, his doctors, and a few subordinates, sworn kept in absolute secrecy, no one publicly knew about Andy's diagnosis or treatment. I really wasn't able to change it this evening. I noticed that he was not the same as usual. I've never seen Andy not being the center of attention at a party before. At the last party in the area, I think it was New Year's, Andy was the king of the dance floor. He was the center of attention with such stamina that he was ready to dance the night away. This evening he could not live until sunset, and he barely got out of his chair all evening, except once to go to the toilet. Under other circumstances, I would have remained silent. After all, is it really that obvious to casual observers? What do his employees say? I sighed heavily and took a chance and told him. Brian almost dropped his wine glass. Marilyn, I didn't know. I'm really sorry. I would never. I interrupted him abruptly. And you will never mention this to anyone. Not Andy, not the neighbors. I shouldn't have said anything. It's the wine talking, and I already regret sharing it. We sat in awkward silence for a while. I was basically waiting for Brian to get up and go home. Instead, he asked if treatments were being given and how they were going. They try therapy. He'll end up needing surgery, or maybe just radiation, if that works. What drug is being used? Something called Lamron. Lamron? Oh my God! Brian almost fell out of his chair. As a pharmaceutical distributor, he should have known a thing or two about such drugs. Have you met Lamron? Do you supply it to urologists or oncologists? Oh, we ship a lot of Lamron, even today. But little of it is used in medicine, I believe, due to side effects. This is truly a powerful tool. There are usually better alternatives. He seemed to know about this drug. With some trepidation, I asked, If you don't supply a lot of Lamron to doctors, where do you supply it? Mostly to state prison. They use it for sex offenders. I would guess that's most of them. Sigh. It's time to end our evening. I started cleaning. Brian took the hint and quietly wished me good night. I didn't sleep well that night, and the next night too. I felt betrayed by Andy for telling his secret about his diagnosis to Brian. But more than a betrayal, I began to realize a growing sense of helplessness regarding Andy's treatment. It was clearly necessary for medical reasons. He or his doctor could end it at any time. But Andy was a completely different person. I didn't realize that the anti-hormonal treatment actually meant that he was unable to have sex. Brian changed that perception dramatically for me. Suddenly, the change in Andy's behavior became more understandable, and I had to deal with this for probably several years. I started looking for my own ways to relieve stress. The boys returned to school. I started every morning with two hours of cardio. My body at 35 did not get any better after giving birth twice without any help. However, I could still easily wear leggings, a sports bra, and a baseball cap with my long hair tied in a ponytail. It was midweek when I realized that the dish on the kitchen table was not mine. These were Brian's leftovers from the ribs he cooked for the party. I decided to go next door to get him back, somewhat put off by the fact that I was wearing tight workout clothes and sweating. I confidently rang his doorbell, and it took him a while to answer. He walked up to the door with his headset on. Sorry, I'm on a conference call. I could have been brief. Sorry, Brian, I just returned your plate from last day. See you. I turned and quickly walked away. Seeing Brian in daylight was surprisingly inspiring. Visually, he is not the same person Andy is or was. Maybe 5'11", ladies know what I mean, he's not 6, and weighs about 175 pounds. He's cute, he's young, but he's not Prince Charming. I left thinking it was too bad, it didn't work for him with Shannon, she was way out of his league anyway. It's a pity that I rate my neighbor this way. Damn, I'm really going to have to find an outlet for my frustration soon. About an hour later, I have lunch in the kitchen. I see Brian on his back deck, eating a sandwich. I decided to go outside and finish the conversation I was about to start, interrupting his virtual meeting. 
After a minute of screaming in the backyard, he motioned for me to come over. I grabbed my water bottle and sunglasses, once again completely ignoring the state of my clothing. At the top of his deck stairs, I was greeted by a wolf whistle. Oh my God, Marilyn, you conquered the gym this morning. I haven't even been to the gym. But of course, I blushed from such attention. We talked a little while sitting on his terrace. Brian once again expressed his gratitude for our private conversation several nights ago and assured me in the sober light of day that this secret would remain confidential. I explained that the boys would be home from school soon and I needed to politely excuse myself to get a few things in order before they came messing up the house again. As he was about to leave, Brian awkwardly stood up and asked if we could come over to his house for a bit he wanted my opinion on something Shannon had left behind. I stupidly agreed and followed him inside. His face turned beet red and it wasn't from the sun. Uh, Marilyn, I need to ask you something in person. Yeah, I suddenly felt awkward. I'm not good at this. Marilyn, it seems like we're both in a bit of an awkward situation. Describe the situation, Brian. Sorry, I don't quite understand. Well, what do I mean? And it will be awkward. But I will be in a relationship for a while, and you're obviously in a difficult situation taking care of Andy and his treatment. I had a pretty clear understanding of where this was going now. Have you ever thought about finding a friend with benefits? At first I laughed. My initial response was enough to make Brian laugh too. But after a few seconds I was still smiling and Brian looked completely serious. Brian, you can't mean you're not proposing. You... I'm really not trying to offend you, Marilyn. You are an amazingly beautiful woman, and of course, Andy's faithful wife. I know that under any normal circumstances, you would never think of something like this. I started to get irritated, and I was a little confused. It's been a long time since I've ever made a serious proposal, and this has certainly never happened. Brian, slow down. I can't even have this conversation right now. You are an attractive young man, objectively still trying to recover from Shannon's rejection. It will pass sooner than you think. You need to focus your energy on finding the next Mrs. Brian Randall and not offering your neighbor some tacky friends with benefits. Brian's eyes sunk into his head. He looked defeated. Ugh, I understand, Mrs. Kazak Collins, Marilyn. I'm sorry if I misinterpreted the situation or made you uncomfortable in any way. This was my opportunity to show mercy. I looked into his eyes, kissed him chastely on the cheek, and gently placed my hands on his shoulders with a big smile. I assumed that this too would remain a secret between the two of us, and I really should go now. I returned home. I needed to take a shower before the baby bus arrived. It's been two hectic weeks. The boys finally got out of school for the summer and headed off to day camp. Andy worked 14 hours a day and passed out at home every night. To be honest, I haven't seen him maintain this pace for much longer. My usual morning workout was tiring. I was June, it was hot, and I was sweating, changing my clothes every morning and afternoon. I saw Brian again on the back deck having lunch. Against all my own better judgment, I casually walked up the stairs to him. He was surprised at first, and then felt a little uncomfortable when he saw me. How's the search for the next Mrs. S. Randall going? He smiled. Not very good. Do you have any tips to share on how to attract the attention of a beautiful lady? I smiled back. I reached out and turned the doorknob that led into his house. The door swung open, and I walked in without looking back. I continued up the stairs and into his master bedroom. We made love. Instincts are a funny thing, especially when you deliberately ignore them. After our first contact, I knew this friendship with benefits would continue for a while. I truly believed that Brian would look for a long-term partner to start a family with and our little affair would fizzle out. At 28, with a big house in an upscale suburb and a good job, his chances looked pretty strong, at least to me. I also realized that I had chosen the wrong time to stop taking the pills. I knew the risks. Andy and I had no problems conceiving. 
Sometimes I felt a little dirty going to my gynecologist and asking to write the recipe. She was the doctor who delivered both my boys. She knew Andy. It was his people who installed her air conditioner when Andy and I were dating, and then replaced her water heater when it exploded and flooded the basement while I was pregnant with Harry. She may not have known Andy's full medical condition, but she certainly knew about my decision to go off the pill. We rejoiced at Andy's procedure together at my annual appointment in the spring. Obviously, there will be some awkward questions about a new partner if I start taking the pills again. I could find another doctor. But then there was the problem of Andy discovering the pills and having to deal with the return of my constant mood swings. That would give everything away right away. How can I explain an unwanted pregnancy to my lover while keeping everything a secret? I felt on top of the world. The first week, the boys went back to school after the summer holidays. Then toxicosis began. On the third morning, I realized that I was in trouble. Real trouble. My instinct was quite cruel. I didn't want any more children under any circumstances. Andy just couldn't find out. That meant Brian didn't have to know either. This meant that this could not really happen. And this meant that this pregnancy would not continue. We live in an affluent, socially traditional area. Clinics are clearly not represented here. Oh, you can find someone to do it. But not locally. I needed to make an appointment and go. Someone had to take charge of the boys for the day. It had to be Andy. I needed an excuse to explain my absence. I found it in an obvious place. Harry's birthday was in three weeks. I ordered a gift. Delivery was possible, but we didn't have a place to hide it. The deception was that I would pick up the gift early in the morning and take it straight to my parents, where it would be kept until the birthday. I'll stay with them for a while and probably be back in time to pick up the boys from the bus. Andy didn't ask questions. I scheduled the appointment for Tuesday morning at the earliest possible time and asked Andy to at least take the morning off. I figured that if anything went wrong, I could always call and make excuses for car problems or something else so he could meet the boys if I didn't make it back in time. Tuesday arrived and I left home at the time Andy usually leaves. Halfway through, I had to stop to deal with the morning sickness that I had somehow managed to hide the entire previous weekend. I think it was obvious that I wasn't feeling well. That happens. Our home has recently become a regular medical center. I arrived at the clinic early. I asked for an appointment at 9 a.m., thinking I needed time. I was in the waiting room at 7.30. These clinics are strange places, inconspicuous, clearly the kind that want to be easy to find but not attract attention. During the 90-minute wait, my thoughts wandered away from Andy and back to Brian. Despite our agreement to be friends with benefits, I have to admit that I started to have real feelings for him. I think this happens when you sleep with someone regularly. I kept thinking about his desire to have a family, about his suffering after leaving Shannon, about her advice to love and find a woman who will make him happy and start a family. I don't think she meant the wife and mother next door. I started to feel nauseous again. I went to the toilet and threw up for the second time that morning. I didn't even eat or drink anything all day. Part of me wanted to get this over with. I've always hated the first trimester. But in the hour I had left, I couldn't get Brian out of my head. What would he do if he found out? What was I going to tell him? We haven't been together for the last six days. He must have been expecting my presence or wondering what was really going on. The nurse entered the waiting room. Mrs. Collins. The doctor is ready to see you. I stood up, turned around and quickly walked out of the building into the parking lot. The ride back was everything but smooth. I kept telling myself that I would come back, but first I had to explain myself to Brian. I kept thinking about Andy and I's wedding anniversary dinner in December and his admonition not to make family decisions that might be irreversible. Terminating an unwanted pregnancy, would it be irreversible? Unfortunately, almost all the alternatives seemed like this. I texted Andy to say I was home early and parked at the house at 1000 p.m. I had two hours before the school bus with the boys arrived. I didn't even go into the house. I went straight to Brian. Brian came to the door to meet me. Hi, Marilyn. God, how I missed you. 
He looked outside, closed the door, and took off his shirt, revealing his tan torso. He took my hand and his eyes went to the stairs. My legs remained in place. Uh, Brian, we need to talk. Half an hour later, we hugged and cried. None of us knew what to do. If I was afraid before, now I am terrified. No matter what happened, I was not ready to leave Andy under any circumstances. Brian seemed to have other ideas. Many ideas. Crazy ideas. Brian was literally on his knees in front of me, begging me not to terminate the pregnancy. He desperately wanted to say or do something to give our child a chance. I knew that this was what I expected, and now I realized that there would be no elegant way out. I promised Brian not to return to the clinic without talking again. But I needed to leave. I needed to collect my thoughts and take control of the situation. I saw that he did not believe in my promise not to return to the clinic. Brian suggested a seemingly unlikely option before I left. Bring our baby to term. I acknowledge that I am the full biological and legal father. You can participate in your child's life as much as you want, or not at all. I will take care of the child and support him financially 100%. The baby doesn't even have to know who its mother is if you decide not to participate after birth. I couldn't believe my ears. Tears flowed like a river. I needed to get home and collect my thoughts before the boys arrived. Every day my condition became more difficult to hide. Somehow I managed to survive boys' week at school. But by Friday I was in bed all the time. The house was completely falling apart. Piles of dirty laundry, takeout containers, piles of unopened mail, you name it. Moms don't have sick days. Andy thought I had a stomach virus. He suggested we go to urgent care. I think I knew better. In a final act of defiance, I decided to try to have a normal Saturday. For a while, everything went well. I cleaned the kitchen and washed, folded and put away the laundry. By the boys' dinner, I began to lose ground. But she didn't give up. I managed to get the boys to bed before locking myself in our bathroom and starting to throw up. Andy stood outside the door, waited patiently for me to come out. I think he began to suspect something because it was not typical for me to get sick and not see a doctor. An hour later I left. Honey, you look terrible. What the hell is going on? I left the bathroom with tears in my eyes. Like I said, I'm a terrible liar. My eyes betrayed the guilt that I had somehow managed to hide for the past two weeks. Marilyn, oh my God. Silence. Maybe I should have expected something like this. I should have known. That's enough, Andy. It's not what you think. But that was exactly what he thought. It was written all over my face. He was just too busy with his own problems to notice. Looking back, I'm surprised how long I hid what was happening. And he took his hat and headed towards the door. I'll go for a walk. I need to calm down. And he returned home after 11 p.m. He was surprisingly calm. This was not typical for him but now everything has changed. He looked into my eyes. Living room, talk. I walked hesitantly towards the chair. For some reason, I felt the need to stay away. I knew Andy's story and recognized the potential for an explosive argument. What happened next shocked me. I've been thinking about all this for the last two hours. About my health, this year, our future. I think I really neglected you. I started sobbing and crying quietly, Andy, no, please, I'm so sorry. SHH, let me finish. I know you didn't ask for all this either. Damn it, Marilyn, you're an attractive 35-year-old woman, and I'm a sick and weak 45-year-old man. I don't know what I was thinking, thinking I could get away with all this. Now I was crying openly, if my hormones weren't right before. Marilyn, stop crying. I don't have time for this nonsense. I want us to fix everything and continue to live as if nothing happened. I'm asking no, I'm telling you, after this conversation I expect you to do two very specific things. First, you will break off relations with the one I have to thank for this. It's probably better if I don't find out and you never tell me. No boy is worth going back to jail because of a woman, I learned that lesson early and now I have so much to live for. I looked straight ahead, without emotion 
except for the tears flowing down my cheeks. Secondly, at the first opportunity, you will terminate this pregnancy. I will not raise another man's child under my roof. Long pause. Have questions? Fine. I am going to sleep. Our next conversation will take place when you have completed the two tasks I have assigned to you. And he left the room without showing any emotion on his face. It took me half an hour to calm down and stop shaking. I took a blanket and fell asleep on the sofa out of fatigue. Sunday morning, I woke up feeling better. Andy and the boys were in the kitchen preparing breakfast. The boys and I are going to an amusement park for the day. Please use this time to get your affairs in order. An hour later, they were gone. This was my first chance to get back to Brian since I left on Tuesday. He knows. Brian turned pale. What did he say? I think he said he might even forgive me. Will he forgive you? Is it true? And he acknowledged the circumstances that led me to this. He asked to simply end the relationship and terminate the pregnancy. After that, we will discuss what will happen next. And what do you think will happen next? Don't know. Will we pick up the pieces of our broken marriage? What do you think this means? I think that means he's probably going to leave you anyway, Marilyn. I didn't really think about it. Andy and Brian will always have opposing positions on this issue. But I have to admit, he never specified what would happen next. However, he made it clear that he would not tolerate humiliation. I cannot accept the termination of our pregnancy. Marilyn, this means everything to me. Everything for us. Andy could stay like this for the rest of his life, or worse, die next year. We could have a family, our family together. Brian, whether he stays or not, I'm still madly in love with Andy. It doesn't matter if he's alive or dead, I will always support this man. Brian fell to his knees and cried. I didn't want any of this to happen either. I was wrong to put everyone in this situation. But I can't change the mistakes of the past. Please, Marilyn, don't make another huge mistake because of my actions. I gave Brian a long hug and then turned and walked home. The thought that I can leave his house and his life forever corroded my soul. Running into Andy was supposed to be bad, but for some reason running into Brian felt a hundred times worse. Who was I really in love with? I spent the whole day of Sunday in bed. On Monday, too. Whatever my decision, I failed. Without intervention, which I did not expect, my life would change dramatically and quickly. After hours of thinking, I decided that this is my life and I will take responsibility for my decisions, no matter what Andy or Brian want. But what do I really want to do? Do I want to raise another child? Do I really want to leave Andy for a man I've only known for four months and is 17 years his junior? Will I be able to bear the possible separation from my boys? I was confident that I was in control of all these decisions, but it was still not clear to me what exactly I was going to do. That night, Andy came home and resolved all doubts. The fight I had been dreading since Saturday night happened on Tuesday night. He simply asked me if I had completed his assignments. I gave him an evasive answer that he didn't want to hear. He asked again when it would be done. I just looked away. He abruptly left the house, slamming the door. I didn't see him on Wednesday or Thursday morning. On Thursday afternoon the answer came to my home. Hello, are you Mrs. Marilyn Collins? You have been served with a summons. I was holding a petition for separation in my hands. Andy wasn't as indecisive as I thought. The petition looked as if it had been prepared hastily. Obviously Andy was upset. In our state, if there are children, divorces take time. The petition for legal separation was the first step in starting the divorce. It essentially signaled to the court our intention to officially live separately. I called Andy in tears. He answered on the first ring. Marilyn, I want you to know that I still love you, but I can't live with you right now. I ask you to respectfully leave. The boys need to stay in their home, and I ask my mother to come and stay with them while we deal with the situation. I was angry that he expected me to leave and be separated from the boys. He still didn't know where I was having my affair and didn't seem to suspect that it was literally the guy next door. 
I couldn't believe he had the audacity to try to kick me out, especially in his condition, and insist on terminating the pregnancy just to please him as the first condition of any possible reconciliation. I decided that I could be decisive too. It's time to pack your things and leave. Andy needs to see that he's not the only one in this family who wears pants. I spent the rest of the day packing clothes, personal items, everything I needed, and loading them into the car. It was raining outside, it seemed like giant tears. I started the car and parked at Brian's house. This was intentional, with full confidence that Andy would soon return home and notice. Instead of walking to the back door as usual, this time I calmly and confidently walked to the front door. Brian opened the door, looking a little dazed. Hello, dear. I'm home. There was no turning back now. A cold war has broken out between the Collins and Randall houses. Andy returned home and immediately noticed my car in the neighbor's driveway. He instantly realized that his plan had failed. He may have initially tried to shock me into following his instructions, but instead he only encouraged me to leave. It was now clear that I was openly violating both of his demands for reconciliation. Brian didn't know what to do with me at first. We never officially dated and certainly didn't live together. He promised to take care of the child, but we didn't discuss what would happen to our friends with benefits relationship. Will it just continue like this? Will we eventually start an official relationship? At first, Brian suggested maintaining some formal distance for the sake of separation and divorce if they eventually occurred. This lasted about 20 minutes. I literally held the proof of our connection in my stomach, and nothing we did now would change that. Our first evening together was a continuation of what we started in the summer. We had never spent the night together, let alone slept together after sex. I was nervous like the first time. Brian was unmoved. Andy and I met again at the hearing three weeks later. We were required to undergo mandatory consultation. This was a blessing. There were many problems. Andy's health, his over-obsession with business, what to do with the boys, my betrayal, separating our finances. Three months later, we spoke politely again. Andy was not in the best of health, and although it weighed heavily on my heart, his compromised capabilities, undermined by the Lamron treatment, were wearing out even faster. He unexpectedly accepted my relationship with Brian and joked that he was even responsible for us getting closer. Andy never gave up his position, even when it came to choosing a lover for his wife. He quickly agreed to joint custody of the children during the separation, which became a trial run for our eventual divorce. There was even a check for $50,000, so I could support myself and create my own bank and credit accounts, which I haven't had since we got married. It was simply an advance on any future divorce settlement. My relationship with Brian also evolved. Of course, we slept together from the beginning, but our existence as life partners was not normal. It's really starting to normalize. Habits were formed for entertainment, shopping, eating, everything we needed to do to coexist as partners and not just lovers. There had been no public acknowledgement of our relationship yet, but my car parked in his driveway every night seemed to attract the attention of even the less than close neighbors. The boys were a different story. They struggled with their father's increased presence in their lives. He would get them up in the morning and send them to school. I would meet them after school and manage the evening routine until Andy got home. This was my signal to leave for the night. The first few weeks were awkward going back and forth between the two houses. Eventually, it became natural for the boys. They really didn't understand what was going on. All they knew was that mom was now spending the night at Mr. Randall's and that she has a baby growing in her belly. Over time, we have moved from simply existing to thriving. Despite this, I was constantly tormented by the thought that Andy was literally sleeping in the house across the street, alone, sick. Our lives took different paths. Three months later, I gave birth to a beautiful baby girl. Clarissa Jane Randall was born at two in the morning on a windy March night. I instantly became the second most important woman in Brian's life. He took to fatherhood like a duck takes to water. For me, Claire was the daughter I never planned to have, and I couldn't even imagine how much I needed her. I also fell in love with her at first sight. 
If I ever had any doubts that our lives were going down the wrong path, I didn't know it yet. I didn't know yet. Our first three months with Claire flew by quickly. It seemed like spring turned into summer in the blink of an eye. I saw the boys every day, and they also loved spending time with their little sister since school was out for the summer again. While I was home feeding Claire, the boys were getting a little wild between our two houses. It's time to turn my attention to the settlement of my divorce from Andy. We never tried to become a couple again. Andy couldn't accept my decision to take his destiny into his own hands. It was too much for his ego to control. Meanwhile, I became more and more in love with Brian. I still had feelings for Andy, of course, and probably always would, but more as a man who deserved respect for his business achievements and for his physical strength, which was gradually fading. Our divorce was finalized as summer turned to fall. The transition was surprisingly seamless. I was back to being the housewife I'd always been, only now managing two houses. We agreed to joint custody, which meant no child support. Of course, there was no alimony for me, despite the lack of ways to support myself. I agreed to a lump sum payment representing my share of our joint marital assets, minus the business. Despite my active role in building Andy's business in the early years, I was unable to claim 50% of the company. In the end, I agreed to 20%. Realistically speaking, this coupled with a decent monetary compensation and Brian's already significant income and assets, no one was going to be poor in our extended family. I had a financial incentive to keep Andy healthy to protect my stake in his company. The next step was obvious, if a little awkward. Brian proposed and asked me to become his wife officially and completely. We got married in a quiet ceremony three months later. Andy wasn't present, but the boys were. I respected Andy's decision to stay away. I felt guilty that my life was back to being even better than before, but Andy's life seemed disorganized. In a show of independence, I refused to change my last name from Collins, at least officially. Brian was annoyed at first, but I explained that it was easier this way with a boy's school, and it was just a hassle. He accepted it, but wasn't thrilled. Socially, I happily called us the Collins Randall family. Our first year of marriage was idyllic, almost normal. The neighborhood gossip died down and people seemed to begin to accept our unique family dynamic. Our sex life had cooled down from what it had been like during my pregnancy with Claire, Brian was careful because he didn't want to accidentally get pregnant again. But Brian desperately wanted a son of his own to balance out the Randall family. Reluctantly, I agreed that we could try again, and this time on purpose. It took a few cycles, but I eventually became pregnant with Brian's second child. This fourth pregnancy was the most difficult for me of all. It seemed like all the morning sickness from my first three pregnancies had been packed into my fourth as the final test of motherhood. I was bedridden. Brian quietly supported me by caring for all children, regardless of need. My love for him only grew during this time. It also brought home the significant changes in Colin's home. Brian took the boys home late on Sunday after they spent the weekend with us. His relationship with Andy had remained cold but polite up to this point. But as they say, this time was different. Upon arrival, Andy sent the boys into the house. He decided to shake Brian's hand firmly at first, then his grip conveyed a strength and pain that Brian had never experienced. Andy looked at Brian coldly and said, Never forget that Marilyn was my first wife. He let go of his hand and Brian quickly walked away. Awkwardness cannot describe this feeling. It took him several days to tell me this story. As I entered the second trimester of pregnancy, Another hiccup occurred. Andy Dior is sick, seriously ill. He was hospitalized for a week with a high fever from an unknown infection. Eventually the source was found and after treatment he was stable enough to return home. The maternal instinct in me did not want to leave my first son. I stayed in the hospital for several nights and when he was discharged home, he chose his usual bed in his father's house. I was willing to sleep on the floor of his room to make sure he didn't relapse. I was five months pregnant. Although I didn't notice it, my body became radiant. Hormones, hair, my enlarged breasts, everything looked younger and healthier during pregnancy. My bladder was fuller too, 
and I was making a few trips to the bathroom down the hall when Andy showed up. He had that look in his eyes, like someone possessed. I've seen this look before. At first I ignored him and calmly went into the toilet to empty my bladder. When I left and apoval me, against my will, into my bedroom. Our former marital bedroom. Has he recovered? I didn't have time to think. We made love. Then I started crying. For many emotional reasons. For violating my vows of fidelity to my new husband. For the feeling of forbidden pleasure with my ex-husband, which I thought I would never feel again for many reasons. It was the most emotionally charged moment of my life. When it was over, Andy sincerely apologized. He admitted that he should have restrained himself. He was without Lamron for the first time in almost three years. Three months have passed. Seeing me pregnant and available made him lose control. He begged me to forgive him. I didn't know what to think or say. I was stunned by all the consequences of what happened. I went back to Andy Jr.'s room and cried all night on his floor. The next morning I returned to Brian's house. His questions were about Andy Gior. I didn't mention anything about my encounter with Andy. The problem was that now I wasn't just apologizing to Brian. I felt a strange sense of apology to Andy for leaving him. So I reluctantly began an affair with my ex-husband. When I felt confident my hormones were raging or I wanted sex, I would seek out Brian to make love to. In those moments when I felt submissive, I wrote to Andy to arrange a meeting. This behavior continued for several weeks. One evening, after meeting up with the boys and having another chance encounter with Andy after they had finished their curfew, I noticed that my stomach was hurting. I realized that something was wrong. I quickly returned home to Brian, who was asleep in a chair with baby Claire in his arms. I went into premature labor. I screamed at Brian, scaring Claire and causing more chaos. Ironically, the next step was to call Andy and ask him to look after Claire. I explained that it was an emergency, that I was going into labor, less than half an hour after having sex with Andy. He was stunned and looked lost as Brian rushed Claire to his door. I don't really know what happened, or even if my interaction with Andy that night played a role. God, I felt terribly guilty for almost losing Brian's baby this way. Fortunately, this did not happen. I gave birth to a four-pound baby girl early this morning. We named her Cameron. She had to spend several weeks in the neonatal intensive care unit, but she lived. My condition was not so definite. I was put under anesthesia for emergency surgery. No more pregnancies or need for pills. Oddly enough, this brought me relief, considering that my family, which I thought was complete after two children, had recently expanded to four. Unfortunately, this ended Brian's dreams of having a son, at least with me. We were busy for the next few months. Brian and I were busy taking care of the girls while Andy managed the boys. I followed the recommendations to give my body a chance to recover and abstained from sex for at least three months. This was probably a needed reset for me. Brian remained the same caring father he always was. I recommitted myself to being a better wife and mother to my children. I shouldn't have had sex with my ex-husband anymore. I also had to be more attentive to my new husband's needs, knowing full well what could happen if he began to feel ignored. I was so busy taking care of the kids during the day that I almost didn't notice that a friendship was beginning to form between Andy and Brian. The tension that seemed pervasive during my recent pregnancy has disappeared. It gave way to the evolving concept of co-parenting among the three of us as almost equal participants. Andy and the boys even agreed to babysit the girls so Brian and I could have a night for two. What seemed impossible just a few months ago was starting to become as normal as everything else. It was this growing sense of normalization of our two households functioning as one that set the stage for my most unpleasant encounter. It was Andy Jr.'s birthday. Andy agreed to have a party and invited everyone, including friends and neighbors outside the family. This was the first time we actually held a public event in one of our homes collectively as the Collins Randall family. Although I was confident in my role now as Brian's wife rather than Andy's, I still felt whispers as everyone watched how naturally our family functioned together. The word triplets was used, 
although not in my presence. I decided to take the girls home for bedtime and leave Brian and Andy to deal with the neighbors themselves. Two hours later, I returned to Andy's living room, long-range baby monitor in hand. The neighbors have left. Nothing was cleaned up, but the exhausted boys went to bed. Andy was sitting on the couch, and Brian was opposite in a chair. It was obvious that they were having a serious conversation. I sat next to Andy and across from my husband, since it was the only seat available that made sense. A little awkwardly, Andy reached out and took mine. Marilyn, I think Brian has something to tell you. Oh no. I took a deep breath and noticed that there was no emotion on Brian's face. Brian's voice shook. Honey, Andy, and I talked. He made it clear to me that I owe you both an apology. I wasn't at all sure where this would lead. Keep going. I took advantage of you at a time when I knew you would be vulnerable. I initiated sex that openly disrupted your marriage to Andy. I took advantage of a man who was sick and could not protect himself. As a result, I put you in an absolutely impossible situation. The situation with your husband and family. Silence. Tears were streaming down my face again. I asked Andy to forgive me for taking advantage of him in his unique moment of vulnerability. He graciously accepted my apology. I want to ask you to consider forgiveness as well. I really didn't know how to respond to that. Much of it was ancient history to me. Each of us in the room had a mountain of potential sins to confess. Why are we even having this conversation now? Around this time Andy, who was still awkwardly holding my hand, squeezed it tighter and looked at me. Marilyn, I also have something to confess to Brian and ask for forgiveness. Andy's voice conveyed his usual confidence that I knew so well. I had a feeling in the pit of my stomach that something serious was about to happen. I have committed my own sin, which I am ashamed of and which needs to be brought to light. A few months ago, I was finally able to stop treatment with Lamron without finding any trace of cancer. It so happened that I made a decisive attack on Marilyn one night when she was caring about the boys. Her noble intentions did not matter to me at that moment. I did not respect her oath of loyalty to you. I regret my actions, Brian and Marilyn, please forgive me. Suddenly I realized that I was still holding Andy's hand while he confessed to Brian. I shuddered, let go of his hand, and turned away sharply when Brian's voice broke the silence. Andy, I accept your apology. I gave Brian the look of disapproval that all wives give their partners when they know they've immediately said something wrong. At this point, Brian didn't seem to know what happened after that first night, or maybe he just didn't care, and Brian wasn't upset. I wanted him to jump up and protect me, but he just sat there quietly. And he started grinning at me. My voice became defiant. Brian, could you excuse Andy and I for a few minutes? I'll be back to talk to you soon. Certainly. Brian stood up, looked me in the eye and said, Marilyn, I love you. I opened my mouth to answer, then turned and looked away. And he adopted a neutral expression. Brian left the house and closed the door. Immediately, I stood up and slapped Andy. What the hell is happening to you? He smiled. Baby, you kicked him out before I could continue my confession. I was going to confess again, this time about the night Cameron was born. Go to hell. I turned and walked out abruptly. I returned to the house two minutes after Brian left Andy's house. My anger and emotions were out of control. Brian, what the hell happened there? You're sleeping with your ex-husband. Brian, he just admitted that he did it against my will, and you accepted his apology without saying a word. How dare you? How dare you start sleeping with a man who is not your husband? I rolled my eyes. Seriously, dude? You didn't even try to protect me. What was there to protect? You didn't say a word to me. That suggests it was consensual. Nonsense. How many chances did you have, Marilyn? Sounds like it happened months ago. What was I supposed to say? I can't even begin. How many times? What? Marilyn, how many times did you go back and have sex with your ex-husband 
after you found out he was sexually available again. Go to hell, Brian. We didn't have a spare bedroom. I lay down on the floor of Claire's room, trying to sleep. I couldn't stop crying. Fortunately, she was fast asleep. At some point that night, I fell asleep with tears on my face. Since her little sister took over her crib, we bought a crib for Claire. The next morning, I woke up late with my little daughter sleeping next to me on the floor. Brian stood in the doorway holding Cameron. I followed them into the kitchen. Brian turned on the coffee maker. He placed Cameron in her playpen and Claire in her high chair. I turned and collapsed into his arms, crying and shaking uncontrollably. Brian just stood there, hugging me. Why, why, why? I sobbed into my husband's chest. He just stood there, quietly holding me. Brian, I'm so sorry. Silence. I should have come home and told you. I was stunned. I was unprepared. I, I. I forgive you. What? I forgive you, Marilyn. I cried in his arms for another ten minutes. The girls needed our care. Claire realized that her mother was upset and began to cry. Cameron then joined her. We had to put this blast on pause to cope with our day. Brian and I had a lot of things to work on, that much was clear. But Brian was not like Andy. He wasn't controlling or vindictive. He didn't have an oversized ego. If I could forgive him for not coming to my defense in the heat of battle, he could certainly forgive me for the few instances of infidelity with my ex-husband. The same ex-husband who he himself manipulated into taking over his wife and two children who now occupy his kitchen. As I said, we could all confess a mountain of sins, but it wouldn't change anything. We'll get through this. Brian and I were determined to get through this together. After the day was over, I sat down on the couch next to my husband. Brian and I have never fought like this before. If it were up to me, we would never quarrel like that again. Without a word, Brian stood up and took my hand. He led me upstairs to our bedroom. Where do we go next? Brian seemed to have anticipated this question. Marilyn, I don't know, but I'm so scared that I'm going to lose you. Will I lose me? This was not the position I expected. Why do you think you'll ever lose me, darling? Because you're still in love with Andy. That doesn't mean it. I mean it. Well, I really think. I decided to shut up. I hoped we could get back to making love. You know, show, don't tell. But the moment has already passed. We fell asleep in each other's arms, at least for a while, until the crackling sound of the baby monitor forced me out of bed. The next few weeks were a period of normalcy again. I didn't feel comfortable being at Andy's house alone, even just to look after the boys. It wasn't just that Brian might not have trusted me, I realized that I didn't trust myself. I tried to have the boys come to us with all questions. But there are cracks in the facade of our happy one. Two housed existences were everywhere and became impossible to ignore. Andy and I still haven't spoken face to face since that fateful party. Brian seemed aware of the pressure this put on me as the matriarch of this young family. Marilyn, how are we going to get over this? The fact that you're so uncomfortable being around Andy now. I also thought about this question, but the real answer was not the one I was willing to share with Brian. He was right to be worried. My defensive reflexes kicked in simply as a reaction to the realization that I still had unresolved feelings for Andy. No, they weren't as strong as my feelings for Brian. And for me, I made my choice, even if it was a choice made under pressure. I didn't go back to Andy. I remained married to Brian. But I couldn't trust myself to remain faithful to Brian if I had the opportunity to cheat on him again with Andy. The fact that Andy was himself again in character was something of a turning point, and I continued to struggle with it. It didn't help that over time all communication took place directly between Andy and Brian. They talked every day, called, texted. They became friendly again. Brian did forgive Andy, and Andy seemed to acknowledge that I was as much a part of the destruction of our happy marriage as Brian was. The illness gave Andy perspective his time and health were not guaranteed. We all needed to make the most of the time we had left, and in a sense, that's what Brian and I have already done. It's just that no one planned what would happen after Andy's treatment. 
the time was so uncertain, the diagnosis was unclear in terms of treatment and whether it would work or not. On one side I saw a man in free fall, and on the other a man with his hand outstretched, asking if I wanted to jump. I jumped in and ultimately walked away with no immediate regrets. But now, the unresolved conflict remains. Andy is still a person I love deeply. I don't know what the future holds for him, but every day that passes is another missed opportunity for connection that cannot be regained. We need to make the most of the time we have left, as tomorrow is not guaranteed for any of us. Brian and I spend the next few nights having deep conversations about this. Eventually, we realize it's time to make a decision and Brian surprises me by taking the lead. Somehow, we found ourselves again almost where it all began. On Andy's back porch, sipping red wine while watching the sunset, the boys entertained girls on the backyard grass. Brian took it upon himself to organize what would be said next. But as always, it was Andy who started the conversation first. Marilyn. Brian admits that despite everything that has happened between us all, I still have incredibly strong feelings for you. You are the mother of my boys. We were enjoying our incredible life together before fate intervened, and we both did the wrong things. Turns, I believe that you have the same strong feelings for me. Brian spoke next. Marilyn, I love you more than any woman I have ever known. Our relationship began under the most favorable circumstances. Through it all, my feelings for you have only grown stronger. You have given me two of the most beautiful daughters in the world, and I will forever be indebted to you for this. I know that no matter what happens from now on, I will never leave you, and I must trust that you will never leave me. You will forever remain my wife, no matter what happens. Tears streamed down my face, and he spoke softly next. Marilyn. Brian has agreed that from now on you can spend one or two nights a week at home with me. No questions asked, no strings attached to anyone, and no pressure to decide now, when or how. Brian confirmed, This is an open invitation from us to you, Marilyn. We love you, darling. I continued to cry harder. I looked into Brian's eyes. Is this really what you want? No, honey, that's not the question. The question is, is this what you want? I got up, wiped my eyes, and went to the grass to check on the children. The next morning I called and made an appointment with my lawyer. No, it's not what you think. I have decided to legally change my legal permanent name to Mrs. Marilyn Collins Randall. Our triple alliance is taking shape. Nothing changed overnight. Life went on with a little less tension on the surface. I had spent most of my life up to this point as a product of decisions made for me by others. Of course, I chose to work for Andy, seduce him, and ultimately marry him. He made every other major decision in my life, with the possible exception of when to start our family, for the next twelve years. I was completely out of control when I moved in with Brian, and although I have more control now than before, I realize that the taste of power is intoxicating. Being able to openly control my destiny with the two men I love will be the defining opportunity of my life. I don't want to accidentally ruin it. I wasn't going to jump straight into bed with Andy. I didn't even really want it. It would almost be like he told me to do it, and it wouldn't work anymore. Brian didn't ask me about my plans, if it had happened yet, or when it would happen. I assumed he was a gentleman. I certainly continued to take care of his needs at home. He was not ignored. But did Brian know that nothing much had changed yet? It turned out that he knew, because Andy kept telling him, and I think Brian had every reason to believe him. After a few weeks, I decided I was ready to stop teasing. I asked Brian if the boys could spend Saturday night with us. The moment I asked, he didn't even look up from what he was doing. The answer was, of course. This had happened dozens of times before, why should this time be different? Despite my attempt at caution, I decided that perhaps I needed to be a little more obvious. On Saturday morning, I made it clear to Brian that I would stay to put the girls to bed and leave him to entertain the boys while I quietly went away. And don't wait for me. I wanted to be 100% transparent about what I was doing, although I didn't want to be pushy about it. Part of me wanted to see him struggle, blink, something. 
raises his voice and tells me I'm making a mistake. Even the silent look of his eyes betrays his jealousy. I didn't see any of this. The sun set, and I quietly walked to Andy's under the cover of darkness. I entered the house as usual. Andy was sitting on the couch, looking at his phone. He looked up and met my gaze. I didn't say anything, turned around and walked slowly up the stairs to the bedroom. My arrival was expected. The candles were lit and burning. The bed was neatly made and then opened. I continued to scan my surroundings when I felt Andy's large hands on my back and his breath on my neck. What took you so long? I was putting the girls to bed. Funny, I mean, I was expecting you weeks ago. That's why I'm only here today, Andy. Now it's going to be about me. Andy laughed. Okay, let's see how it goes. What's it like to sleep with your neighbor's wife, Andy? You were my first wife, Marilyn. You will always be my first. We made love. I didn't plan to stay overnight. Returning home, I really hoped that he was sleeping. He didn't even try to pretend. Brian turned and hugged me. I shuddered at his touch, mostly out of guilt as I silently recounted my evening. Brian spoke up. So, how was your night? I went from feeling guilty to irritated. I wasn't ready to recount any details today. Just hold me, darling. He did it. I fell asleep in my arms comforting husband Brian. Chance encounters with Andy remained unintentional from then on. I think I intended for it to be that way. I had enough at home, and although I wanted my freedom to be with Andy sometimes, it was just much more natural, comfortable, and easier to spend my nights with Brian. I was a busy mom. My days were busy. I was tired. I didn't have time for complicated planning and running around just to satisfy another man. I think Andy was expressing some disappointment that I wasn't on a more frequent visiting schedule. He let Brian know his thoughts on this. In his honor, Brian shrugged and said, talk it over to the boss. The problem was that the boss got almost everything she needed at home, and Brian was proud of it. Andy decided to up the ante as soon as he could. He organized our first family trip for the Collins Randolph family to one of those all-inclusive family resorts in Mexico. Two weeks. With seven people, we would need either a large suite or several rooms. The solution was to book three rooms, one for the boys and Andy, one for the girls and Brian and I, and one dedicated solely to adult intimacy that would be mostly managed by me. Holidays have always had an impact on me. Andy regularly received club trips paid for by HVAC companies at the end of the summer. It was one of the highlights of my first marriage that I have never been able to forget. I was ready for a repeat here. Getting there was tedious. Traveling with children is such a headache. The boys are old enough that Andy had it pretty easy, but Brian and I were overwhelmed. Andy was clearly annoyed when I announced that I would be spending the first night alone with Brian and the girls. We quickly fell into a routine. We all gathered for a family breakfast at 9 a.m. We then set the kids up for activities by the pool beach, and once everyone was settled in, Andy and I made a quiet retreat into the intimate room while Brian looked after all four kids. I would do the same for Brian after lunch by asking Andy to take on the role of baby monitor after lunch. This super wife and mom was determined to make this vacation memorable for everyone. Spending time with Andy first might not have been the best decision. My uncomfortable feelings in every way became unbearable on the seventh day. Andy and I had just started our morning class when there was a panicked knock on the door, startling us both. It was Brian. Harry cut his finger badly on a beach rock and resort security intervened. They compared the bracelets and, noting the lack of formal relationship between Brian Randall and Harry Collins, requested parental permission for transport and registration at the hospital. Harry's wound required stitches, and he waited in tears for his parents to leave the resort. Andy answered the door wearing only his boxers. If Brian had any question about what Andy was hiding down there, he now had an answer. But the worst thing was that Brian met my eyes as I covered myself with a sheet, trying to hide my body. Brian's look of worry when he saw me in bed shook me to the core. At that moment I felt terribly guilty, although he knew where I was and what I was doing. 
but he had never seen it so openly. The awkwardness continued as the door closed, and I quickly got dressed. Brian stood in the hallway, leaning against the wall. I ran out the door as quickly as possible and took Brian's hand. His weak reaction spoke more than just his concern for Harry, but also his dislike of seeing me and Andy being intimate. My enjoyment of the holiday practically ended at that moment. I was ready to go home. Harry will be fine, but his time at the beach and pool will be limited for the remaining week of our vacation. That night I felt the need to apologize to Brian. He brushed it off, expressed concern for Harry, and apologized himself for the circumstances that led to the interruption of our personal time. Once I got home, I continued to physically distance myself from Andy. Part of this was due to lingering feelings of guilt over what I could imagine this was doing to my husband. I didn't want to ruin my second marriage, and I let Brian know that. He received everything he needed at home from me, and there was simply no time left for other things. However, Andy was not going to give up without a fight. One day, when I came to pick up the boys in my usual tracksuit, still working on regaining my figure after four pregnancies, Andy subtly suggested that I meet one of his clients, who was a plastic surgeon. I rolled my eyes, but eventually agreed to make an appointment. I cared about my appearance, especially with a husband seven years younger and constant access to my ex-husband. I had to look the part if I wanted to maintain my status as a trophy wife. Once again, it backfired on Andy in the most predictable way. In the end, I decided to have a modest breast lift and implants, as well as a full abdominoplasty tummy tuck. Four pregnancies seriously affected my figure, and I could not get it back without outside help. The operation was incredibly painful. I hadn't had sex for at least a month, and it was six weeks before I could get straight again. Once restored, I was pleased to present the updated Mrs. Collins Randall to my husband for his review and approval. The boy was delighted with what he saw. My new sexy body combined with six weeks of break was the boost our love and sexual relationships had been waiting for. I was most confident in the bedroom, showing off my new hot wife's body, and Brian worshipped the ground I walked on. We started having sex several times a day. During my recovery period, Andy decided that I was no longer enough. He found himself a new girlfriend, Erica. She was an attractive client whom Andy had known for a long time and who was recently divorced. She was between Andy and me in age. He made no attempt to hide their relationship and even introduced her to me for the first time as his girlfriend a few weeks later. I was glad he took this step. Maybe it was time for him to finally move on. Although it was clear that they did not live together, Erica sometimes spent the night at Andy's, even when the boys were home. This bothered me a little. I suggested that Andy send the boys to me if he needed some privacy, but that rarely happened. Any night I had the boys over, Andy and Erica would disappear, perhaps spending time at her house. I could only guess. This routine continued for most of the next year. The boys seemed comfortable talking about Eric, and Andy seemed to be slipping back into his old ways. I spent less and less time at their house, relying on the boys to come to me rather than the other way around. My relationship with Erica was normal, I saw her from time to time, and although she undoubtedly knew about my past with Andy, I laughed imagining that she had not heard the whole story of the last few years. I never found out what happened. One day the boys reported that Andy and Erica had broken up. They looked a little sad, and I could tell that their father's attitude was starting to worsen his relationship with the boys. I shared the news of my breakup with Brian. So, I guess it all starts again? Will it start again? You and Andy. I don't think so. I mean, no. Things won't go back to normal. At least not anytime soon. I want him to find a new partner, hopefully long term. I'm with you now, Brian. Perhaps everything has already passed. I still had feelings for Andy and always will. My initial feelings of guilt about restoring it and the desire to regain something of what we had already lost together were strong enough to convince me to give it a chance. But my feelings have evolved. I want Andy to find a new number one, and I don't want to distract him from that mission. And I want to dedicate my energy to being a super mom to all my kids by day 
and a trophy wife to my second husband by night. The morning was like any other. I was in the kitchen with Brian, helping feed the girls and start their day. Suddenly, the back door swung wide open. It was Andy Jr. Ma'am, I need your help. Something is wrong with Dad. The intonation of his voice spoke of panic. I jumped out of my chair, leaving the girls with Brian. Somehow, I managed to stop, turn around, and grab the phone. Maybe just to text Brian after I make sure everything is okay. Walking into the Collins' house, I immediately realized that everything was not at all okay. Andy Juar led me into his father's bedroom and into the bathroom. Andy lay face down on the floor, convulsing. It looked like he was having a seizure. I immediately dialed 911. I spoke calmly to the dispatcher and sent Andy Juar to the side of the road to wait for an ambulance. When the ambulance arrived, the attack was already over. Andy was delirious and semi-conscious. Paramedics carried him out of the house on a stretcher and took him to the intensive care unit. Three days later, I sat in an uncomfortable chair in the office of oncologist Dr. Robert Frown. To my left was my husband Brian, and to my right was Andy. I was holding both men's hands when Dr. Frown came in and sat down. Andy was stabilized in intensive care. A CT scan performed upon arrival showed a tumor in his brain, which was undoubtedly the cause of the attack. A biopsy had already been performed and Dr. Kunais Frown came to discuss the results. I offered to accompany Andy to the reception. He was no longer allowed to drive. I asked if Brian could come over to support both of us as we were all preparing for the possibility of bad news. Andy was in no position to refuse me. Dr. Frown addressed Andy directly. Mr. Cal Collins, as we suspected, the biopsy showed a malignant tumor. The tumor in your brain is due to a relapse of your previous disease. Unfortunately, tumor markers are very aggressive. In your case, surgery is not an option. There are really only a few things that can be done here. The room filled with silence as I began to openly cry again. I squeezed both men's hands tightly. Andy remained unperturbed, as always in such situations. What's next, doctor? Dr. Prince Frown remained clinically precise and straightforward. The only treatment option is chemotherapy. It will reduce swelling and prolong your life by several months. Unfortunately, many patients who go this route wish they didn't have to. This will inevitably prolong the period of significant suffering for you at the end of your life. If it were me, knowing what I see in this practice, I would pass up this opportunity for such a humiliating experience for the patient. But I respect your wishes if you choose to follow this path. Get your affairs in order, Andy. Fast. Even without treatment, we can control the attacks with medication for several more weeks, perhaps up to a month or longer. Now is your time to cement your legacy. Make the most of it. I can help you stay as productive as possible and as time progresses, as comfortable and dignified as possible until the end. Andy stood up unsteadily and shook the doctor's hand. Frau. There was no discussion of further treatment options. Andy asked to take him home. I had to ask Brian to drive us. I was too upset. Upon arrival, Andy asked to be left alone. He kissed my forehead in front of Brian and told me Andy Jr. would call if he needed anything. Brian and I walked into our house and I fell to the floor crying. I was stunned. I wasn't ready for Andy to die. At the same time, I was angry with him. He was always such a terrible patient. He did not see his doctor for follow-up treatment for several months. As his wife, I always handled these tasks for him. Like his ex-wife, he was on his own. As the day progressed, a feeling of guilt came over me for not being there for him, as if I could somehow prevent this. And he got down to business following Dr. Bishop Brown's advice. His priority was managing his business, his life's work. He wasn't particularly worried about the boys, trusting that they would be safe and under the loving care of Brian and me. He became a virtual recluse in his home, spending time around boys and, during school hours, in deep conversations with lawyers and other professional assistants. I went to check on him daily, brought him food and offered to take him anywhere. He was always pleasant to me, had few requests, and usually seemed eager to see me go. 
I think he was simply focused on selling his business while he still had time and distributing his assets to cement his legacy as quickly as possible. Sixteen days after our visit to the Dr. Frau, Andy asked me to arrange a private meeting with Brian. I don't know why this made me feel uncomfortable, but it did. I arranged a meeting for the same evening. Brian arrived with a small cooler of beer. Andy met him at the door, smiling and in a good mood. Settling on the back porch, the conversation began with Brian offering Andy a beer. Actually, I'm not supposed to drink. Medicines for seizures. Give me a bottle opener though, it won't kill me. Haha. <laughs> I just wanted to talk one-on-one -on -one about my boys. I know that Marilyn is committed to being the wonderful mother she always has been to them. I just need to hear from you about your commitment. Once I sell my business, their future will be secure no matter what. I just want to know how much you want to be a part of their lives after I'm gone. Andy, I would be honored to be their stepfather. With your permission, I would even like to go ahead and officially adopt them. I want them and you to know that even if, God forbid, something happens to Marilyn, your boys will always have a home with me as their stepfather. Andy sat back in his chair, thinking it over. He stood up and Brian stood up too. Andy hugged Brian and shed a few heavy tears. No more words were needed on this topic. He knew Brian was sincere. Andy quickly finished his beer and asked for another. Now that we've gotten to the bottom of why I invited you, I think it's only fair that I might have one last request. Brian already guessed what would happen next. Andy had already come to him to express his disappointment with me. The last time it seemed that he was looking not only for an outlet for his frustration, but also for a resolution. Keep going, Andy. I know that Marilyn is completely committed to your marriage. Some time ago I realized that you have won her heart, and I need to give up any more claims on her body. The truth is that I never stopped loving Marilyn. Not the day I found out she was cheating on me. Not the day I asked her to leave or found out she moved in with you. And certainly not on the days when I managed to get her attention after that. Brian, as her loving husband, I ask that you cherish your wife, protect her, love her, and never let her forget me after I'm gone. I think Brian was a little surprised that there was nothing more attached to this statement. Is there anything else? And he smiled. Brian, my dream would be to spend the night with Marilyn one more time. But I can't ask her for this, and I'm not going to ask you to do that. Your promise to respect my family after I'm gone is more than any man in my position could hope to ask for. Brian stood up and hugged Andy again. They both had tears in their eyes as Brian began his walk home. I was on pins and needles waiting for Brian to return. He briefly recounted the conversation to me. And that's all? What will he do with his business? When is he going to talk to me? It was never really discussed. He said he'd like to spend one more night with you. I guess I expected something like that. But he didn't want to ask you about it. It seems his intentions were pretty clear. Is this what you want? No. I mean, no. I think my voice trailed off. Expensive. In a few months everything will change. We'll have boys and we'll be a family 100% of the time, all six of us. I would never want it to happen this way. Whatever happens between now and then doesn't bother me. My goal is to start our family, all six of us together, after Andy leaves. Then, for the first time, I can relax in peace, knowing that you and our family are finally all mine. I left the room, away from Brian. My emotions were out of control, and I felt like I might say something wrong. Part of me wanted to remember Andy as he was, as he always was. Not the same as he is now. And Brian was right. We have a lot to decide to secure the future of our family. Do I really need another distraction? I did not sleep all night. Or the next one. And I only slept a little the next night. I think I knew I didn't have much time. Eventually, time would run out and fate would befall me. She is always catching up. Not yet overtaken. The next morning I woke up early to a text message from Andy with one word. Tonight. There was no need to explain. The message has been received. I could ignore him. But she didn't do it. 
Instead, I decided to let Brian know before I did something I would regret for the rest of my life. Brian Andy reached out and made it clear that he needed help tonight. I decided to answer his call. As usual, I was waiting for his sharp reaction. Jealousy. A caustic comment. Instead, Brian came over and hugged me tightly. Andy asked me to love and protect you forever after he left. When that time comes, Marilyn, I want you to know that I will never, ever let you go again. Make this night unforgettable for both of you. I spent the day preparing for this as if it was the most important night of my life. Nails, hair, took a long shower. I used to always go home with my hair in a ponytail and a sweatshirt. Tonight, after the girls were put to bed, I walked down the stairs in a black dress and high heels. Brian whistled after me again. I blushed. Marilyn, I love you. Give Andy the best. I kissed him. I love you, darling. Thank you. Andy met me at the door. The boys were downstairs. He looked at me twice and said, I can't let them see you like this. He pointed me up the stairs to wait in his bedroom while he put them to bed. An hour passed before he entered my bedroom. He closed and locked the door. Marilyn, I need to tell you that I feel like my body is giving out. I can't promise that I'll be the person you know. I really just wanted to have one more time with you while I still have the chance. And by the way, my eyes work great. My God, I like what I see. There was a small jewelry box on the table by the bed. Inside were my wedding and engagement rings from Andy, which I had returned in our divorce many years ago. Andy took the box, dropped unsteadily to one knee and asked, Marilyn, you were my first wife. Will you do me the honor of being my wife again tonight for the last time? A tear rolled down my cheek. I didn't expect anything like this. Andy has never been a romantic. Apparently, he learned a thing or two from watching Brian all these years. I removed Brian's rings and Andy carefully replaced them with his own. I looked into his eyes and asked him to make love to me. We fell asleep in each other's arms. I woke up at 5.30 a.m. when the first rays of light came through his window. I needed to leave. I didn't want the boys to wake up and see their parents in bed together. They were old enough to understand what it meant, and they already had enough to worry about their father's health. I changed my jewelry and put on a dress. Damn, I should have brought a change of clothes. Andy was still sleeping. He looked calm. I kissed him goodbye. I couldn't stay longer without getting upset, and I had to go. I got home, showered, changed, and was ready for my day before the girls even woke up. I couldn't stop thinking about how difficult the coming days would be for everyone. To distract myself, I went to work, business, shopping, anything I could to keep myself occupied. I was rushing home to start my evening route to sports practices and kids' activities when I noticed Andy's truck was missing from his driveway. This was strange since he was not allowed to drive a car. Somehow I tried to get it out of my head. I drove the boys home after sports practice. Andy and his truck were still missing. I followed the boys into the house and realized Andy wasn't there. His laptop was in his office, but his backpack was missing. I returned to the office and found a white envelope on his desk with my name written in his handwriting. Suddenly I was overcome with fear of what I might find when I opened the envelope. Marilyn, please take care of our boys, your girls and Brian. I want you to enjoy the life I always imagined for us. During this time, I will be your loving husband for eternity. Love, always and forever, Andy. The coordinates were handwritten in the corner of the sheet. 38XXN121XXW. I had no idea what that meant. I entered the coordinates into the search app, and the map showed a location in the nearest state park. I gasped, realizing the meaning. I dialed 911 and didn't know what to say. Finally, I explained that my ex-husband was terminally ill and had run away from home. He left a note indicating a location in a state park. I asked that an officer be sent to the location to see if he could be found there. The dispatcher said she would try to have an available officer check the area as soon as possible. An hour passed and nothing happened. I started preparing dinner for the boys in Andy's kitchen, trying to tell Brian what I had found. He didn't have many words. 
After another half hour, an unmarked police car stopped in front of the house. Another unmarked car and then a patrol car pulled over and parked closer to Brian's house. I began to sob, realizing that whatever happened next, it would not be good. The detective approached the door and asked to enter. He introduced himself as Investigator Callahan and asked for my documents. I provided my driver's license and he used his phone to call one of the other officers. He said my name, Marilyn Collins Randall, and asked if the address was current. He looked at my home address against Andy's home address. A sly smile appeared on his face, which I noticed almost as quickly as it disappeared. Callahan asked to speak privately. I asked the boys to go to the basement, and we sat together in the living room. A uniformed officer walked in, and my nerves reached their peak. Mrs. Collins Randall, we have been able to locate your ex-husband, Andy Collins. I regret to inform you that when we found him, he was dead. The investigation is ongoing, but we have located a 2018 Model 2500 truck registered to Andy Home Services, Inc. Between tears, I replied, it's Andy's truck. The vehicle was found unlocked with the keys inside. There was an envelope taped to the steering wheel. The note inside read, Whoever discovers this note, please inform Dr. Buffer Robert Frauwat a Dr. Sig Sauer. I was able to perform surgery and successfully remove the tumor. I smiled, and then I started laughing out loud, and then I started crying, hysterically. Andy ended his life himself. Even in his final moments, his dry sense of humor showed through, and he remained 100% in control until the bitter end. I texted Brian to bring the girls and come over. We needed to talk to the boys, and I wanted us to be together. Tonight begins our journey to try to heal together as a family. Andy died at the age of 52. I'm now 42. Brian is 35. With any luck, I had a lot of time ahead of me with Brian and our four children. The sale of the Andy Home Services business was completed within months of his funeral. Andy's will was clear. 50% of the proceeds from the sale must be distributed among employees in proportion to their length of service. His longest-serving employees became millionaires overnight. 25% was to be distributed to a trust intended for the boys and not available until their 21st birthday. The 20% should have gone to me, as prescribed in our original divorce agreement. The remaining 5% was to go into a trust for Claire and Cameron, earmarked for their education, wedding expenses, and investment in their first homes as adults. The fact that he left something for the girls came as a huge surprise to Brian and me. Brian was especially touched. I felt that this was a fair retribution for Andy's treatment of Claire while she was in my womb. Obviously, there were no hard feelings. The boys already had their own room in my marital home with Brian. The girls did not have the same comforts in the Collins home. We immediately began repairs. Brian and I agreed that we would never be separated as a family again and would split time between homes to keep the boys comfortable. The master bedroom, the place where Andy and I were intimate as husband and wife in the last years of our marriage, and then periodically thereafter, would be converted into a girl's room with an in-suit Brian, and I never, ever could have imagined sharing this space together as a couple. The boys will keep their rooms. We renovated the guest room to become our new marital bedroom when we spent time at the Collins home. I soundproofed the walls, floor and ceiling, and installed an extra lock on the door. Brian kept his promises to Andy regarding the adoption of the boys and my respect as his loving wife. Over time, Andy Jr. and Harry accepted Brian as their full stepfather and then simply as their adoptive father. Brian adored them as much as he adored his biological daughters. We sold the Collins house a few years later when the boys went off to college. As we approach 50, Brian and I are beginning to look forward to the time when the girls graduate from high school and we can finally become empty nesters. Brian continues to worship the ground I walk on. I remain deeply committed and completely in love with my husband to this day. Our hearts remain broken but complete. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think, click to the next one.